first of all, uh, welcome uh, everybody. So this, yep. So just to get started, who am I? Uh, I'm a security researcher from Montreal. Uh, I'm currently working at Desjardins and uh, we have a group named ETIC. This is usually the name under which uh, we do most of our publication related to security. Uh, I also help organize a bunch of events in Montreal and uh, Quebec City. So usually if you, if you come to Montreal to some event related to security, there's a good chance you're gonna see me uh, there. So just to get started, uh, so today uh, I'm gonna first go as to why uh, I wanted to build this plugin, how it was built, there's gonna be a very, very short demo, and some of the future improvement to uh, what's be, what has been done. So just to give a bit of background, uh, last year I published a piece of research that was called a Prototype Pollution Attack, uh, and I wanted to continue this research on a bit uh, larger scale. And what I realized very quickly is that uh, continuing this, this, this type of research on a more uh, larger scale required me to have some static analysis or dynamic analysis tool because it's otherwise a huge pain in the ass to uh, review a lot of code. So I started to look at what was existing and I found there was barely anything that uh, could be used for this type of thing. So one of the main reasons I started to make this uh, static analysis engine was just to continue my own research. And the second reason is that uh, the existing tool uh, to do uh, endpoint identification are for most part only using regular expression, which has uh, some kind of significant uh, limitation. So how it was built. Uh, when I started to build this plugin, I asked myself uh, if I was to look at a piece of code, how I would identify endpoints in that piece of code. So let's say that we have a very, very simple uh, piece of JavaScript code. How do we identify endpoints? Well, the first thing we would, uh, that we would look for is first of all, identify where are the Ajax call. So in this case, uh, we would see that there is an API for the jQuery API that's dollar.get and we would see that this is where we can have a potential URL that's passed. However, we see that there are some var uh, that the URL is dynamic, uh, which means we don't know exactly what its value yet. So what we do is we look at the variable that, it's, uh, that are used to, to build this URL, and we find where they are coming from. So we can see that some parts are a static value, some other parts are arguments that come from the function. And after that, we would look to uh, identify what are the possible value of foo, and we would look at where ABC is invoked and to find uh, the possible first argument of this function. And at a very, very high level, this is how uh, the uh, plugin and the engine behind uh, the tool uh, works. So this is uh, a very, very uh, brief explanation, and it might look easy, but in practice, uh, not exactly trivial to build uh, this, this sort of engine. So what do we need to, uh, to build this? Well, we're for gonna first of all need some way to uh, make some symbolic representation of the uh, abstract syntax tree. And we're also gonna need uh, some sort of call graph representation that we're gonna be, uh, be able to navigate to uh, resolve function arguments. And just for those that are not necessarily familiar with static analysis, uh, I'm gonna uh, refer uh, to AST uh, in the slides as abstract syntax tree. This is basically sort of a object representation of the code. So instead of dealing with a massive string, we're just gonna deal with uh, an object representation that represents each tokens of the syntax of the language. This is uh, usually a representation that's uh, very commonly used uh, for static analysis. Yep. So first of all, I'm gonna talk a bit about what does it mean to do some symbolic representation. Uh, symbolic representation is basically just meaning instead of dealing with actual volume, we're gonna actually represent variable as symbol. So if we don't know exactly, for example, in this case, the volume that base uh, and foo holds, we're simply gonna represent the volume of target as a concatenation of two variable. And eventually, uh, if we can concretize the volume and replace those value afterwards, uh, yeah, we're gonna use this symbolic representation. Also, as we analyze uh, code, uh, when we're dealing with symbolic value, we can also uh, do some replacement. So let's say that we have a piece of code where we have the two following statement, uh, where we have two assignment. Uh, in the second assignment, uh, when we're gonna uh, make the symbolic representation of it, 
As we already know the symbolic uh, value of ABC, we can already substitute it with uh, its volume. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's a few things I wanted to touch in this presentation, is especially uh, uh, topics that are very, very, very specific to doing uh, static analysis in uh, JavaScript code. And uh, one of the uh, very important things about doing static analysis in JavaScript is mostly to correctly identify which variable maps uh, to what. Because uh, whenever you're dealing with uh, code or minified code, it's going to be very common that there's going to be variables which are going to have the same name but are not going to be the actual same variable. So if we're doing some symbolic analysis and we just point to, let's say, and we just say this is a symbol for the variable A in some places, uh, we can get uh, a very confusing results if we're treating all the variable A as this exact same thing. So we need to correctly identify which variable is which. So there's a few rules that need to be taken into consideration uh, in JavaScript. The first of all, the first one is that variable and functions are uh, hoisted. And what this means is that a variable, no matter where they are declared uh, inside a, a scope, are always considered to be uh, declared at the beginning. So even, so let's say that we take a look at this uh, sort of funky code uh, and we're trying to identify what is the possible, what is going to be the value of A when ABC is going to be invoked. Uh, we might think that it's one, two, three, or two, three, four, but it's actually going to be neither because if we uh, follow the rules of uh, oisting, uh, we're going to actually uh, uh, realize that uh, the equivalent uh, that's the, that what's actually happening is the following thing, is that the variable A is considered to be declared at the beginning, and uh, yeah, so the value is going to be undefined. So what this means when doing static analysis of JavaScript code is that whenever we're entering a scope, we must always do some sort of pre-analysis uh, that's going to gather all the variable and let declaration uh, before doing any analysis, because otherwise we can uh, have cases like the function that I showed here where we're doing some incorrect analysis as to where the variable comes from. The other thing to, uh, to be aware, aware of is all the variables are resolved in the JavaScript language. Uh, let's say that we are trying to identify which variable the foo and vol, uh, var, value uh, uh, represents. Or, or the, wait. Let's say that we're trying to identify what foo and vol a variable are actually uh, mapping to. Uh, for the f for the vol uh, variable, uh, yeah. So just gonna take a break. Uh, yeah. So basically, the rules, uh, the way they say, is that we first of all have to look in the current scope. So for the vol variable, uh, we can see that uh, there is a var declaration for the same name in the current scope. So we know that the the, the vol variable maps to the var uh, to the to the, the variable that was defined in this scope. However, if we look for the foo variable, we, uh, we can find a var declaration for the foo variable. So we have to look in the parent scope. So in this case, we, uh, and since we find it in this scope, we know that it's the foo variable from the parent scope that it actually maps to. And if we couldn't find it there, it would be considered global or the parent scope. Yeah, so yeah. So the way the engine uh, deals with this is that, first of all, uh, the symbols that we're using for variable are not directly uh, the variable name. Uh, whenever we encounter a new variable, we're assigning them and giving them some sort of unique uh, identifier. And this really helps to correctly distinguish between variables which have the same name but are not the actually same variable. So when we're entering the, uh, when we're starting to analyze, let's say, the, the function ABC, uh, we will build a map that says for the variable uh, foo, it actually maps to a symbol which has the name global ABC foo, and for the vol variable, it, it's actually mapping to a symbol that's global ABC vol. And when we're entering a child scope that's inside uh, the scope of the function ABC, uh, we, uh, we first of all make a copy of the parent scope, uh, the, the mapping of the parent scope, and we override a new value uh, that exists in the child scope. So we would see that the vol uh, maps to, the, uh, to a symbol that's inside of the child scope, but that the foo still maps to the same variable that was in the parent scope. So in this way, we're correctly 
uh, mapping to uh, the correct uh, variable. Yeah, and we also need, uh, yeah, and we also need to build a, a call graph. So every time we're doing uh, this analysis and we encounter a new function call, we're basically storing information about uh, this function call. And we're basically keeping as a key uh, the uh, name of the function or the symbol that's called. And also, as we already have a symbolic representation of the arguments at this point, we're also storing uh, the symbolic representation of the argument at that point. Yeah, so the basic, and basically what this uh, sort of call graph allows, allows us is that whenever we're gonna try to resolve a variable and uh, try to find, let's say, uh, what, what can, be, what can uh, the value of the first argument of the function ghi can be, uh, the way we're gonna parse this is that we're gonna see that uh, the first argument uh, is actually, can actually be a variable that's a function a argument from the function def we would look at where the EF is invoked. Uh, we're going to see that one of the, in one of the invocation, it's a variable that's a function argument uh, of the function ABC. And we do the, the same thing until we find uh, that uh, the value can be a constant, which is slash API. So that's roughly how the call graph is navigated. So now that we have all this information about both the call graph and some sort of symbolic representation, uh, of the code, how do we identify Ajax call uh, into this? Well, the way uh, the engine works is that it looks at all the function call that it gathered uh, during this analysis, and it looks for very, 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 very specific uh, signature of function uh, that are called. So it looks, for example, a global object that's named dollar.get, get, and uh, an object that's of type XML HTTP request dot open. So it's very, very precise thing. It's not just uh, something dot get, something dot open. It's very, very precise thing that we're uh, looking for. And this is to kind of help with, uh, to, to avoid a uh, false positive. So once we identify that the function is actually uh, an Ajax call, uh, we're also uh, doing the same analysis uh, to resolve uh, the function arguments, which are kind of the only arguments that can still be resolved in the symbolic uh, representation. And this gives us a list of possible value uh, that, uh, that, the, that the endpoint uh, can call. Yeah, there's a few things about uh, resolving arguments that are still uh, noteworthy to mention. Uh, it's mostly like two uh, cases uh, that need to be taken into consideration. The first one is when we're trying to resolve an uh, argument, it's very important that we resolve them uh, all at the same time. Because one of the naive way to uh, implement a variable uh, resolution is to say, uh, in this case, we're trying to identify what are the possible value of foo. Uh, it would give us that there's two value, which are, which are five and three. And we're going to separately uh, identify the possible value of bar, which would give us two and four. However, if we're doing like a cross match of those, uh, it, would give, it would tell us that, our, that there are four possible uh, values uh, for uh, the URL, which is uh, false, because as we can see in the code, there's only two invocation of the function ABC. So uh, when we're resolving the, vol the variable at the same time, uh, it would correctly give us that the only two possible values are 5, 2, and 3, 4. The uh, other thing that's uh, sometimes happen is that sometimes the variable uh, that come, that are function arguments, uh, come from different functions, so we sort of have to prioritize uh, which function arguments we have to resolve first. And the rule that I found to work the best and causes the least issue is to always start with the one that's like the deepest. So in this case, we would start by analyzing uh, bar, and then we would resolve foo as it uh, afterwards. Um, yeah. So I'm going quite fast, which is good because I'm going to have time for other thing. Yeah, so uh, one thing that's really uh, interesting is that at this point, we're always able to kind of reconstruct uh, uh, the information about the URL. So we can already gather the static part of it, and we can already tell that some parts are going to be dynamic. And yeah, this is already useful information because uh, we're going to know which parts are dynamic which means this is usually the parts we're going to want to fuzz. Uh, however, what's really interesting to also provide is to also uh, be able to tell 
uh, that the dynamic value where this comes from in the code. So the way the engine uh, does this is that whenever we're transforming values from the AST to their symbolic value, we're also keeping all the information that the AST has uh, in regards to the code location into the symbol. So whenever we're trying to resolve uh, the value and we can find a concrete value uh, for uh, the symbol, uh, we still have information about where it came from in the code. So we're passing that information along. Yeah, and in that way, uh, not only can we provide information about the URL and what's the variable part, but we can also tell what, the, what, the, what those variable parts can come from. Yeah, and one last thing before we jump to a very, very uh, short demo is that uh, there is some partial AngularJS support uh, in, the, in, in, uh, in the engine, and AngularJS is like a huge pain in the ass to deal with uh, with static analysis, it, and this is mostly because it heavily uh, uses dependency injection. And dependency injection is something that's uh, statically, uh, that to analyze st entirely statically is uh, almost nearly impossible. Uh, uh, yeah, so the way the engine uh, kind of supports a little bit AngularJS is a bit uh, by cheating, is that uh, the dependency injection, uh, at least the way it works in Angular, is kind of easy to fingerprint. So basically what we're doing is whenever we're encountering signature uh, that, that we know are the dependency injection signature for Angular, we're gonna interpret these uh, dependency injection as function call uh, to the actual function. So even though there's no function call that's directly there in the code, so in this example, even though there's no uh, direct uh, invocation of the function ABC, we're still gonna interpret uh, this piece of code as an invocation of the function ABC with the symbol $HTTP and not HTTP. So this way when the engine tries to uh, identify whether uh, A.get or B.get are uh, actual uh, Ajax call, it's only gonna correctly identify that the first one uh, is an Ajax call and that the second one is a false positive that it's not gonna report on. So, very, very quick demo. Where's my cursor? There we go. So, we're gonna first of all look at a very, very simple website that I made. And yeah, basically we're gonna look at the JavaScript file. Yep, basically uh, we can see that in the code there's like one Ajax call. Uh, some part of it are like completely uh, dynamic. There's some part that comes for, from a constant. Uh, there's one part that comes from a cookie value. Uh, so we sort of have some URL that kind of needs some analysis in order to, to be correctly uh, uh, identified. So if we look at what the endpoint tabs that the plugin adds, uh, we can see that it both correctly identified that the prefix of the URL was like slash line and that uh, one part of the URL was uh, dynamic, which is uh, at var, and uh, that the statement that it's coming from is dollar cookie line or uh, 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 en. So this is already some uh, pretty good information, as we can tell that uh, what the URL is, and we know if we're looking, for example, as to what the value can be, we're probably gonna have to look in the cookie value, that's name line. Yeah, and this is the plugin for uh, burp, uh, there's also the same things for Zap. I didn't make a demo, but it's basically in roughly the um, uh, the equivalent uh, tab for uh, in Zap, which uh, is like uh, how's it called? Yeah, but basically uh, there's the exact same thing. It's about the same place for like uh, Zap. Yep. So I'm gonna have to switch back to my slides. Yeah, so a bit of future improvement uh, on the, uh, a bit of thing on the future improvement. Well, there's a few things that still need uh, to get better. Uh, the engine is still primitive. It's still doing sort of okay uh, to identify endpoints, but there's still like a, lots of improvement that, that, that's gonna have to be done to be an uh, engine that can resolve, or at least can be the end goal that I have, which is to build something that's good enough to do static analysis of uh, more complex thing. 
And there's also, as you can see, the UI is very primitive, as I'm not a UI person. And this is something that's also going to come. So I still have, I think, a few minutes for questions. Uh, this is the GitHub of the uh, main project. Basically, the way uh, it's divided, there's like one GitHub project for like the engine, and there's two separate uh, GitHub projects for uh, the burp and the zap plugin. But both are linked from the main one, so this is the only one you need to kind of remember. Yeah, so if you have questions, there's the microphone on the back. Uh, so just raise your hand and... Okay, we have time for about two, maybe three questions. Um, so when you ask the question, just make sure you speak into the mic. So, what's it here? Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, does the endpoint finder plugins, do they validate the, you find the endpoints, couldn't the plugins just hit the endpoints to see if they actually exist? Uh, this is not something that's currently done. But this is probably going to be in the future improvement. If you have ideas like that, you can just open an issue on GitHub too. Were there any other questions? Going once, going twice. Great. Thank you, Olivier. Yeah, it's good.